Hello and welcome friends to our very first online lecture. Luckily, I got a gaming headset for Christmas, so I actually have a nice mic. Um, okay, so we're going to start today by just going through um, some of the ideas on BioNinja. We're going to do uh, 4.2 energy flow. So this is in our ecology. So this, if if you're right, on the, if you're on this video right now, this is for um, uh, HL. This is for IB Bio HL only. Uh, okay. If you're an SL, we already did this. If you want to look at this as a review, that's totally fine. Uh, but I just want to make sure that we're doing HL is who needs it right now. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and start with the first one, energy source. All right. So as we've talked about before. Okay, the big idea for uh, any of these ecology ideas, um, the big the big idea for any of these e ecology lessons is that energy flows through an ecosystem and uh, that nutrients cycle. So the first and most basic idea, most of this is stuff that you guys already know, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. And you have access to the BioNinja website anyway, but uh, the first big idea is that most of our energy comes from the the sun. That is our energy source. Okay, and as I said, it flows through. Now we already talked about trophic levels and food chains, so we don't need to spend too much time really talking about consumers, producers, and um, ecological niche. Okay. Now this is uh, something that we talked about a little bit, uh, but I want to make sure everybody fully understands. So n energy. When I say that it flows through an ecosystem. Um, I mean, the energy enters the ecosystem through the, in the form of sunlight, or uh, if you're talking about aquatic ecosystems at the bottom of the ocean, it comes in the form of geothermal energy. And that energy is converted by plants and then converted uh, on and on and on by animals and other consumers until it is lost. And heat is, or excuse me, energy is primarily lost as heat. Okay. So a lot of the rest, uh, a lot of the, uh, Heat that is lost is due to respiration, as you see here. Respiration, just basic heat, excretion, uh, a lot of it is stored in the tissues. And if an animal or a plant dies before it is eaten or consumed, then the um, energy will go along with it and will also be lost as heat. Okay? So that's the basic idea uh, from that. Now, heat itself cannot be converted by living systems into other forms of energy. There is no organism that we know of that can just take raw heat and convert it into a usable form of energy. So what uh, what happens is that any heat that is produced is um, ultimately lost. So this, uh, this diagram right here is the best indication of this. Solar energy comes through. A very large amount of it is actually unabsorbed and is reflected back uh, out into the atmosphere or beyond a lot of, and then um, some of it is taken up by producers through photosynthesis and then each consumer each level consumer primary secondary <laughs> top or you know tertiary quaternary each time it is consumed a lot of the energy goes away through heat or uh, detritus carcasses waste excretion pee and poo okay now, some of this is actually converted uh, back into usable energy by decomposers like worms, mushrooms, detritivores, and saprotrophs. But it, that it also eventually is lost as heat. And all of this heat energy, all of it, will eventually dissipate and radiate back into space, where it will dissipate forever until it no longer exists. Okay. Next up, let's talk about energy efficiency. Okay, so this is what we were talking about. This is actually um, the last time we did anything was the homework, uh, <clears throat> workbook pages. So energy, all of that loss from that, all of that energy loss that happens means that when energy is transferred from one trophic level to the next, a very large portion of it is lost, approximately 90%. And it is, that is very, very approximate. A really common misconception is that there's like the 10% rule is 100% accurate. It's not. Okay, you're going to see that when you actually measure the numbers, uh, a lot of times you'll see things closer to like 75, 25 or something even as small as like 2 and 98. Okay, 
that a lot of energy can be lost or that some organisms or some trophic levels, some shifts are more effective. Okay, so the main idea here is that as energy is lost between trophic levels, higher trophic levels store less energy as carbon compounds and so have less biomass. Okay, the reason that that is so important to understand is you've got to think about the numbers. Okay, and this is a great uh, illustration to show it. So with the numbers, if you think about how many producers are in a single ecosystem, think about just the e East Mech ecosystem. I think everybody's fairly familiar with it. Think about how much grass is outside, how many bushes, flowers, trees, okay, primary producers, okay? And then imagine how many first level consumers there would be. That would be all of the rabbits, squirrels, chipmunks, all of the different insects, grasshoppers, um, roly polies, um, you know, any of the flies, as you can see there, any of those things. So many, but not nearly as many as there are producers, okay? Because a lot of the energy is lost and not all of it is able to be converted into uh, mass, into biomass, okay? And this is kind of represented in this uh, diagram by, you know, just literal volume. So 100 liters worth of energy, approximately 10% is taken up by the producers. Approximately 10% of that is taken up by the primary consumers, okay? And then on and on. You're gonna have fewer frogs and fewer secondary consumers than you do primary, fewer third level consumers, fewer tertiary, and far fewer quaternary consumers. So your apex predators in any ecosystem, the big thing to keep in mind is that if the ecosystem is at balance, those predators are going to be in a very small population. Okay, this is because there simply isn't enough energy to support large numbers of those of those uh, organisms because so much is lost through the trophic levels. So much of it is lost. Okay, if you start from the sun itself and how much radiation is happening in an area at a given time, um, by the time you get to the fourth level consumer, you're going to have, I mean, let's think about this, one milliliter compared to a hundred liters, that isn't even that isn't even like a tenth. That isn't even one percent. That's like point zero zero one percent. Okay. That is a teeny tiny amount that is going to be available for this entire uh trophic level. And again, don't forget that this is not individual individuals. Duh. This isn't just individuals. This isn't you know, one population. This is the entire trophic level. So this is going to be all the hawks in the area, any owls that live in the area, anything like that for this example. They're not going to have a lot of energy because there's not going to be that much food for them because there's not that much food for the ones below and on and on and on. Okay. All right. And so to illustrate this idea, what is often done is uh, that biologists and ecologists uh, create these pyramids of energy. Now, a quick reminder and something to keep in mind that our unit for um, energy per area per time is kilojoules per meter squared per year. Okay, kilojoules per meter squared per year. Now, pyramids of energy will never appear inverted, meaning it will never be flipped upside down. You're never going to have it small at the bottom and get bigger. Uh, because some of the energy stored in one source is almost, or sorry, is always lost upon transfer. Um, oop, sorry. Oh my. Go away. Get out of here. Go, go away. How do I get rid of this? There we go. Whoa. Go away. Okay. Okay. So each level, as you go through, of your uh, pyramid should be approximately one tenth of the size. Now, again, this isn't always like the ten percent rule isn't a hundred percent. It's never always going to be ten percent. But when you look at this, so what you're going to notice immediately is that it's not that perfect triangular pyramid shape because we're doing this with actual numbers, not just visually representing them. So with the actual numbers, when you look, you're going to see that in fact, you know, if we start with a million joules of sunlight. Only about 10% of that, and this is this is not represented completely perfectly because you can see these edges are faded. But if we really start here at the producers, this is 10,000. About a tenth of that for 1,000, about a tenth for 100, about a tenth for 10. Okay. So whenever you're doing these pyramids of energy, they've got to look like this. They should be stepped 
they should never be that triangle because that is inaccurate. That is a false representation of the data. This is much more accurate. Much, much more accurate. Okay. Um, as far as the extra content, I don't know that you actually need to know all that much. Yeah, primary versus secondary productivity, not really that important. I mean, this particular um, this particular picture, this particular diagram is just good as a representation of like what you can see. Uh, rather, of, it's a good representation of um, what happens with all the energy. You know, some is lost, as you can see here, some is lost as feces, some is lost as cell respiration, whereas only about 33 joules out of the original 200 are kept in the tissues. So that's just good to keep that in mind. We talked about food webs. I don't think we need to talk more about that. I mean, ecological pyramids, all this is showing is that there are multiple types of pyramids. There's pyramid of numbers, which is population numbers, uh, can be good, except, you know, one tree could be the one producer for an entire ecosystem. And so you're going to see a pretty crazy looking pyramid if you have that. Pyramid of biomass is usually a lot, a lot better. Um, but, you know, kind of same thing. You might have a disproportionate number of, let's say, mosquitoes um, because the just how many or how rapidly they reproduce in an ecosystem. So the pyramid of biomass might also be a little bit skewed, which is why the pyramid of energy really shows very nicely um, the amount of energy and really shows the trophic levels very, very well. So yeah, here's how you can see. So a tree to fly to spider to bird. With the pyramid of numbers, you're going to see this really weird kind of like teeter-tottery looking uh, pyramid because you've only got one tree, but then you've got probably hundreds of flies and then it goes on kind of normally. Pyramid of biomass, you're going to see it look, you know, about what you would expect, honestly, because of um, how much mass is actually uh, taking up the space in each of these, each of the trophic levels, whereas a pyramid of energy shows very, very, very nicely um, exactly the steps between each trophic level. And you can see that it is a little bit different. Uh, it's a little bit skinnier as you go. Okay, so, and then the last idea from this particular one, biomagnification. Um, because energy transformation is only about 10% efficient, higher trophic levels have to consume more prey to meet their energy needs. Now, what can happen is these two words right here, bioaccumulation, biomagnification. Bioaccumulation is a simple idea that pollutants can enter a food chain and they can accumulate in the tissues of organisms. Biomagnification says that those, the amount of those pollutants builds up and concentrates from one trophic level to the next. So the best example that they always like to use is the pesticide DDT. DDT caused eggshell thinning in uh, eagles and other species of birds that fed on the exposed insects. So uh, here's your example. Okay. So you, here's you got your mayflies who are consuming the pollutant. You know they themselves are not getting all that much, <clears throat> but it is still accumulating in their tissues. The bluegill that's eating the mayflies, well, because it has to eat many of them, it's accumulating a bit more. The bass, because it eats many bluegills, same idea, and then the human has a lot. So by the time it gets all the way up, you've got a ton. And we can see a representation of the chemical concentration. So, you know, very heavily concentrated here, but lots of dots, one dot per organism. This one is eating several organisms, so it is more slowly accumulating by the time it gets all the way up. It's pretty, pretty dense. Okay, so that is all for this particular lecture, friends. So thank you for watching. Um, if you have any questions for me, you know, reach out on Remind, DM me, whatever you need to do. Stay cool. Gucci.